differences. Okay, let's start off looking today. We're going to talk about, uh, I can get this thing to quit spinning around, um, viral infections and a few other non-viral conditions, infestations. Uh, the first one of these is uh, Veruca vulgaris, common wart. Um, so hopefully most of you, when you look at this, would sort of say that's pretty classic for a wart. It's got verrucous epithelial hyperplasia. It's got digitated epithelial hyperplasia. Um, it's even got a few coilocytic cells here in the uh, upper part of the uh, this little papillated structure over here. So this is pretty classic for a wart. And the reason we show this, and even most first-year residents hopefully at this point would, would get this right, um, is that there um, are lots of human papillomaviruses that actually cause HPV infection. And anytime there's a question that can be written about what HPV is likely to cause, uh, the virus is likely to cause the lesion, you need to be prepared to answer that question because you're going to almost certainly get it on the board examination. So they like to ask some of the most common HPV types that cause general Veruca vulgaris like this. Uh, they really like to ask the types of uh, HPVs that cause uh, condyloma, the high risk and low risk types. So be prepared for that. Um, there's even an HPV that's been associated with uh, verrucous carcinoma and caraway canthoma. So make sure you know that. And then so-called X disease. I think that's HPV 13, I think is the classic one that's associated with that. And, and that shows the little mucosal warts uh, on the surface of the lip. So um, just know your HPV subtypes. Um, so they, they will ask you some questions about that. It's always nice if you can just kind of commit to memory, something that you know you're gonna be asked and then you get those questions right. And then when they put some esoteric basic science uh, gene on there that you forgot, at least this will make up uh, the difference. So it'll, it can kind of counteract uh, some of those more difficult questions that you may not know. But this hopefully is pretty obvious. You see the verrucous epithelial hyperplasia, you've got coelocytic change. I think if they're going to show you a wart on the exam, they're going to show something that looks like this with coelocytosis. They're not going to show one of these funny lesions that doesn't. Now, there are some other subtypes of warts we'll, we'll talk about. Um, this a shave biopsy, you notice that this one does not have all of that uh, prominent papillomatosis and the digitation. It's got this sort of slight papillomatosis, but it also has these coelocytic change, once again, which are these vacuolated areas in the cornified cells here, and usually in the stratum granulosum or stratum spinosum, as you see here, and they have hypergranulosis and then this pallor. Over here, another example that this is classic for coelocytic change. Now, this can simulate um, epidermal hyperkeratosis a little bit. Uh, generally, with epidermal hyperkeratosis, if you look inside the cytoplasm, you'll see some eosinophilic granules. So there's these eosinophilic granular areas, structures. Those are the abnormal keratin tonofilaments and whatnot associated with uh, EHK. And you don't see those to the same degree as you see uh, in the coelocytic cell of human papillomavirus. So there are some distinctions there. It can be difficult a little bit to distinguish from one another, but in general, uh, you get also abnormal cornified layer overlying it, usually with those same kind of uh, granules in the cornified layer with some parakeratosis. You may or may not get parakeratosis uh, overlying the, the tip of a papilla in, in a human papillomavirus-induced lesion, but uh, there's some subtle differences there and just make sure you kind of can appreciate those when you're looking at under the microscope. So this is a, a Veruca plana, a flat wart, as opposed to a typical Veruca vulgaris. So a little different morphology, a similar type of lesion. Uh, it's an epidermal, mostly papule. So there's really not much inflammation at all in the dermis and it's due to human papillomavirus infecting the uh, epithelium. Okay, so that's a, a flat wart. Now there's some other subtypes of warts, um, and these are you know, probably a little bit more important from a clinical perspective in, in some ways than, uh, than a histologic perspective, but uh, this is something that you should be able to diagnose. And this is a variant of a Veruca called a tricholimal Veruca, uh, also known as a tricholimoma. And immediately you should be thinking in terms of Cowden's disease when you think of tricholimomas and tricholimal Veruca. Uh, generally, if they have a lot of those lesions, 
Um, it's more commonly associated than if you just have one. And notice that low magnification, and this actually is an interesting sort of uh, historical debate because a number of years ago, uh, my professor, Dr. Ackerman, used to basically, he said that these are all uh, warts, that, that there's really, uh, they shouldn't really be called trichlomomas, they really should be called trichloma perucas because they have the overall architecture of a wart. And um, they are usually solitary. They're usually submitted by clinicians as roulette basal cell or wart, something like that. They're not really a, in a syndrome most of the time. And so he just basically, well, these are probably just warts that have features that are differentiating toward the outer root sheath of the hair follicle, like you see over here with these clear staining cells that uh, by now, uh, at the end of the year, you should recognize as, as being similar to that of the trichlinal sheath, the outer root sheath of the hair follicle. Um, However, uh, another one of his former fellows, Dr. Penny's, actually did a study looking to see if they're using PCR, and this was kind of in the early days of PCR, if there were HPV uh, infected cells in a lot of these lesions, and the answer to that was, in the most, most cases, no. And so this debate raged whether these really and truly were uh, Veruchi or whether they actually were, you know, just a, a benign adnexal neoplasm that kind of simulates wart. So it's not that important. The most important thing is just to recognize that a lot of people, myself included, still refer to these as being uh, trichloma veruca uh, and not associated with Cowden's. But if there's a lot of the lesions and, and the patient's got the stigmata, you want to make sure that you don't miss the diagnosis of Cowden's. But anyway, uh, you can see the nice example there. Of what looks like it's differentiating toward a follicle, uh, the outer root sheath of the hair follicle with the overall silhouette and architecture of a wart with the verucous papillomatous lesions up here. Uh, and, you know, maybe there might be one or two cells that could possibly be coilocytic uh, cells. I'm not really going to say that's definite here, but um, that's something that might sort of make you think that perhaps the lesion really is sort of an HPV-induced lesion. There's no real HPV that I'm aware of that actually has been associated with this lesion. Uh, there, maybe there is. Uh, you can double check me on that. But uh, just the most important point is to realize there are a number of these lesions that are sort of thought to be warts. The other one would be a so-called inverted follicular keratosis, which is basically a similar lesion that's got a lot of squamous eddies. And probably the most important clinical uh, element of that entity is to make sure that you don't overdiagnose that as a squamous cell. Uh, they often occur in the head and neck area, often of young individuals, and call something like that a squamous cell on somebody's lip, they're going to get a, a wide excision when it's just a benign lesion that doesn't really require anything. So that's probably the most important element of that entity. Okay, this lesion, uh, notice uh, it's got a pedunculated morphology. It's got sort of two areas here. This, this is, you can imagine clinically may have looked kind of like a cauliflower. And uh, when you go to higher magnification, it's got this gentle papillomatosis with this acanthosis that you see here. And uh, let's look down here at this area, another nice example of this. And uh, this came from the uh, genital area. And this is an example of condyloma cuminata. Okay, and this is, uh, again, going to be caused mostly by either a high risk or low risk HPV subtype, HPV 6 or 11 being low risk, HPV 16 or 18 being high risk. And uh, a lot of guys, uh, and we do actually do typing of these in, in selected cases in our laboratory, a lot of people do subtyping of these uh, just to make sure that they're not uh, carrying one of these high risk lesions. And that, you know, can be clinically important if the uh, partner, especially if it's a male that transmits a high risk HPV subtype to a uh, female partner, they can get uh, cervical cancer, vaginal cancer. So they, they need to be followed if they have that, that these things often set up stable infections in couples. Uh, but uh, basically the most important thing for you is just to recognize the, the uh, histologic features of condyloma. The fact that it, it looks uh, like a, uh, a little dome-shaped or, or pedunculated papule with these like gentle, usually these gentle papillae. They're not really these spiky papillae like you see with a, a garden variety uh, Veruca vulgaris. And uh, they can be pedunculated and papillated and kind of look like this. If you can imagine, would look sort of like a cauliflower clinically. Now, if you start looking cytologically at high magnification in some of these lesions, you'll often see uh, an occasional mitotic figure. There's no, no mitotic figures here, but you might see a scattered mitotic figure, maybe a couple that are uh, atypical. If you start seeing a lot of those, in the lesion and you get areas that there's full thickness cytologic atypia throughout the epithelium and some foci within the lesion, sometimes within the entire lesion, it's atypical. Uh, then you start thinking about 
boanoid papulosis, which is essentially squamous cell carcinoma in situ rising in the setting of condyloma um, in a patient that uh, has got HPV infection. So uh, that's one of the reasons that we do like to type these and, and if we can, just to make sure that they're not gonna possibly uh, develop into uh, boanoid papulosis. Uh, and that disease you know, can ultimately end up in uh, invasive squamous cell carcinoma that can be pretty aggressive in some cases. Usually it, it's not aggressive. Usually it's uh, confined to the epidermis and you can usually treat it sort of like a condyloma. Uh, but, uh, you know, it, it sometimes can be more aggressive, especially if the person uh, is immunocompromised. So you just want to make sure that you look for that. And that's in the differential diagnosis of, of condyloma. Okay. One other thing I'll just mention is that uh, a lot of times you'll see a lesion that looks a lot like a seborrheic keratosis. Uh, here you see a little, uh, you know, uh, small uh, cyst, a little uh, cyst uh, in the lesion. And you'll see these little... Uh, uh, pseudocystic horns within these lesions. Sometimes it look a lot like a seborrheic keratosis. If you get what looks like a seborrheic keratosis in the groin of a relatively young individual, it's not a seborrheic keratosis. So if histologically it looks like an SK, uh, it's almost always going to be condyloma, even though it can look like a seborrheic keratosis. So histologically, these lesions can sometimes appear like a uh, seborrheic keratosis, but they're really HPV induced and they're actually um, not uh, seborrheic keratosis, especially if it's a young individual. Even if it's an old individual, it, it's still more likely to be condyloma. We all know that there's a very high percentage of individuals that are uh, uh, that carry HPV today. It's it's extremely high. Okay, next we're going to move uh, away from the uh, intraepidermal um, lesions. And one sort of rule of thumb. Uh, when you are looking at viral infections as a general rule, if the epidermis is involved and it causes, uh, you know, like acanthosis like warts or causes uh, viral cytopathic effect, uh, ballooning degeneration, that sort of thing within the epidermis, that's usually a DNA virus. So molluscum contagiosum, the pox virus infections, the herpes virus infections like this, we'll show you in a minute, and then the HPV infections. Those are DNA viruses. The RNA viruses, when they cause cutaneous eruptions, are the ones that usually cause the more biliform eruptions, the measles-like eruptions. So those are RNA. So you can just generally think of it that if the epidermis is involved, it's probably a DNA virus. If the, if the kind of dermis is involved with a little minimal amount of epidermal involvement, it's more likely to be an RNA virus. Now that's not 100%, but that's a good general rule of thumb to think about and, uh, you know, the boards do like to ask what kind of, uh, you know, is this a DNA or an RNA virus? So, again, you've got uh, people that write questions for the board that like infectious diseases. You can always, there's no argument with the answer for an infectious disease question. So, uh, they're almost certainly going to give you quite a few of these on the exam. So, it would be valuable for you to review uh, which of the viruses uh, are DNA, which of the ones are RNA, and how they affect the skin. So, here's another one. And here, instead of getting uh, acanthosis in the epidermis, we have viral cytopathic effect that's not coilocytic. Now we have ballooning degeneration. And viral infections are one of the uh, number one cause of ballooning degeneration in the skin. You all remember there are three main intraepidermal vesicular patterns in the skin. There's spongiosis, there's acantholysis, and then there's ballooning degeneration. Ballooning is where there's actually... Uh, swelling of the cells themselves. They fill up with fluid internally. Um, in this case, you actually have two uh, mechanisms. You have both ballooning and acanthalysis. So here we actually have a lot of these cells that are falling apart within the, uh, in this blister. And then you have other cells where there's this obvious swelling and ballooning degeneration of the cells. And uh, this is a herpes virus infection. And, uh, and you say, well, is this zoster? Is it HSV-1? Is it HSV-2? Just looking at the cytology and the histology, you can't tell them apart. They all look the same. Um, so this you know, very well might have been for somebody that herpes zoster. I mean, it's a pretty florid herpes virus infection, but I can't be sure that this isn't someone that's just got an HSV-1 infection and uh, you just can't tell from the, the histology alone. Uh, I do want to call your attention to the morphology of the multinucleated epithelial giant cells. And then uh, these cells die as well. So, you know, these cells have been infected. 
they fill up with viruses, the virus uh, then uh, gets out of the cell, then the cell dies, and then they leave you these sort of ghosts, these dead uh, previously HSV infected cells. So sometimes if you get kind of a late stage lesion of herpes, uh, you may only see these dead pink cells and you have to look really carefully to be able to appreciate that they're actually even virally infected. And one of the uh, situations where we see this in a clinical setting is where a person comes in with an ulcerated lesion on the nose or the lip and it's shave biopsies performed for rule out basal cell carcinoma. And it's a late stage herpes virus infection where maybe all you see are just a few cells like this or whatever in there. So just keep that in mind from a clinical perspective. If you see the, the classic features of this, um, it's pretty obvious that these are, uh, this is a herpes virus infection. So I want you to be able to recognize that pattern. When you see early changes of a, of a cell, maybe I'll find one that's just kind of an earlier cell that's been infected. Um, the, the earliest change is margination of the chromatin. That means the chromatin starts getting clumped it gets, uh, it sort of precipitates, if you will, at the outer edges of the nucleus. And uh, that's what we call margination of chromatin. And then the cells swell. They can develop these little uh, intranuclear uh, and intracytoplasmic inclusions. Those are the cowdery bodies. I, I don't think you really need to know a lot about which is a cowdery A and a cowdery B body. So I'm not going to expect you to, to know that. The board isn't going to expect you to know that. But just realize that if you've had an early cell of herpes virus infection, like here off to the side, uh, you may just see this ballooning degeneration and this sort of margination of the chromatin. So that's what happens in early cells. And then later you get the uh, dead ghosts of the herpes virus infected cells like you see over here. And one other kind of thing about this is uh, if you're doing a zinc preparation, um, you know, you may have heard, well, you know, swab the roof of the lesion or the base of the lesion. You should swab everything of the lesion. So as you can see, these acantholytic cells are at the roof, they're in the middle or at the base. So just basically, if you're at the bedside and you're going to do a, uh, a zinc preparation at the bedside, swab the whole thing, put all the contents on the slide and basically look at everything that's possibly there. Don't just focus on the roof or the middle of the base, just the, you know, put everything there because we don't know where the acantholytic cells are going to be. And sometimes you'll actually get an ulcer where there's nothing at the roof, where there's no blister left, you just have an ulcer. And you may have to then swab, you know, you see there's a, luckily here, there's a few acanthalytic cells at the base. Sometimes there's really few uh, at the base of an ulcer. Like if you just had an area like this, you might get a negative zinc preparation. So just realize there's a limitation on that. Uh, the last thing just to point out on this is that you can get a very brisk inflammatory reaction in herpes virus infections. There's gonna be a lot of different re inflammatory reactions with herpes. You can get vasculitis, you get a lichenoid infiltrate, uh, you can get a granulomatous infiltrate. And sometimes if you biopsy a late stage lesion, so you come in and maybe somebody's had zoster and maybe most of the lesions are crusted over and you say, well, let's take a biopsy just to see if there's anything in there. And uh, the viral changes in the epithelium have, have gone away you may just have some scale crust at the top. You may have almost a normal appearing epidermis at the top, but you can have a different reaction patterns in the dermis that are the uh, kind of the residuum of the infection. And they can look like a lichen planus like eruption. They can be granulomatous. Um, they can sometimes even be vasculitis. So just realize that there's a, a you know several different nonspecific inflammatory reactions that can be left over when the herpes virus infection goes away. And, and the same is true if you get a really early lesion. So if you biopsy a lesion before there's a vesicle, sometimes you can get a pretty brisk inflammatory reaction with several different histologic patterns, but you don't have any viral cytopathic effect yet. So uh, you, you just may not be able to make a definitive diagnosis, but just realize you can get an inflammatory reaction that can precede the actual uh, changes in the uh, epithelium. You also get perineural inflammation there. Okay, so here we got a shave biopsy, and uh, this comes from uh, acral skin. Uh, notice there are no follicular structures here. We've got acanthosis with a markedly thick and cornified layer, and we've got some blisters in the epidermis. And at low magnification, you can see that this is pink. It's pale, and uh, it's pale because it's swollen. The epithelium is filled with fluid, and uh, when you get the, again, think in terms of uh, ballooning degeneration, and uh, that's what you actually have here. These are cells that are filled up with liquid. And uh, this is ballooning degeneration. And this is classic, again, for a, a DNA virus that's causing intraepidermal ballooning vesicular degeneration. When these blisters get large, just like any kind of balloons, if you blow them up to uh, uh, get them filled with too much 
air, well, then they can pop. They can coalesce, just like the uh, alveoli in, in your lung and somebody that's got emphysema, those uh, blebs coalesce and form larger blisters. So this isn't a spongiotic blister in this case. This is a blister that is developed because of ballooning degeneration in all of these virally infected cells here have filled up with liquid and, and ultimately coalesced and formed this large blister, popped. So this is an intraepidermal uh, vesicular ballooning degenerative process that we see with one of the pox virus infection. Now this, you look at that and say, you know, that just looks like a bunch of garbage, like some fibrin. That's actually the, uh, the viral cells themselves forming an intraepidermal, uh, intracellular uh, inclusion. So this is a pox virus inclusion of someone that's got a para pox virus infection. There's another a little smaller and there are others right in here. So this is a virus factory that is producing all these viral particles. So it's analogous to molluscum contagiosum, uh, but this is just a different virus. And so the, the pox virus infections, you know, ORF, Milker's nodule, uh, smallpox, they sort of all have this same general theme of ballooning degeneration with a very dense, usually inflammatory infiltrate in the dermis beneath. Now, if you look at the old Lever's textbook, they talk about uh, all these sort of uh, grades of inflammation, all this kind of stuff. Forget about that. I mean, uh, this is just basically uh, an intraepidermal uh, infection that induces a very brisk inflammatory infiltrate that gives uh, lymphocytes, sometimes there are neutrophils, there's sometimes some histiocytes in the infiltrate. Uh, sometimes you may even get some eosinophils, but it's usually a relatively dense, boggy uh, type of inflammatory infiltrate. And that correlates with what you see with these people clinically. They get these boggy plaques uh, on usually the dorsal surface of their hands. Uh, they can occur in other locations as well, but uh, they're often thought to be neoplasms. And so that's why you often get shave biopsies of these. Somebody thinks this is a, you know, like a squamous cell carcinoma, or they can simulate sweets uh, and pyotermic gangrenosum clinically. And uh, that's because they have this sort of edematous uh, appearance to them, which would correlate with what you're seeing here. So this is uh, parapox virus. Now, I don't really try to make any distinction between orphan milkers nodule. I don't think you need to either, or monkey pox or yabba pox or all the other, you know, poxes out there. They all basically are analogous uh, and they give you these intraepidermal uh, inflammatory ballooning degeneration that ultimately leads to, to this finding here. So that this would, uh, I don't know, uh, it, you know, this was actually just listed as ORF slash milkers nodule. So we didn't know which one it was. Uh, ORF obviously is caused by sheets, sheep and goats and milkers nodule by cattle. Okay, so here's another pox virus infection and they had this on my board examination. So be prepared. Um, everything on the exam is not esoteric and difficult. So they, they're gonna show you some obvious stuff too. Uh, which is good. It's a confidence booster. So uh, if you miss this, shame on you. You should probably flunk the board if you miss this. So please uh, don't miss the obvious stuff. And this is molluscum contagiosum. Uh, this is the kind of thing they might want to try to make a little bit more difficult. So they might show you this and say, well, you know, even a first month resident should be able to diagnose this. So let's ask them some more difficult questions. Let's ask them some questions about what type of virus causes this. Or, you know, let's, uh, they probably aren't going to ask you the name of the bodies, although they're called Henderson Patterson bodies. Um, but they would, you know, like they're going to show you this and expect you to get it right. And then they might ask you a second order question. And you can see these lesions are pretty characteristic. They give you this kind of bulbous um, uh, epithelial hyperplasia. And, and these actually are are probably infecting the follicle epithelium. They don't generally kind of infect just the glabrous epithelium. They might get into hair follicles and they form these little sort of exoendophytic keratoacanthoma-like lesions. And the other name, interestingly enough, for keratoacanthoma is molluscum sebaceum. That's the old name for KA. It goes way back in the days of, uh, you know, the old textbooks that my granddad and dad used to read. But basically, um, you know, it's, it's called molluscum contagiosum, this is molluscum contagiosum because it's caused by a virus, the other one's called molluscum sebaceum because it wasn't contagious and it was thought to be related to sebaceous glands. We know that it's really more of a follicular-based neoplasm. So it's the same kind of concept as you've got follicle involved here with these viral particles that are causing infection here. And uh, they're, they're classic, um, you know, DNA viral infection of, of the skin. Now, sometimes we'll get a very early lesion of molluscum, and this is kind of all we see, just kind of a little bulbous 
uh, lesion. And if you look carefully, you can see the early uh, changes of the viral infection in these cells down here. So these cells are infected, uh, they're producing the viruses, and then as these cells become uh, later and more evolved, they ultimately end up causing the classic molluscan bodies here that then get transepidermally eliminated and extruded out of the, of the follicular ostea here. And then they go on to cause a new lesion somewhere else in your body. So these lesions, as you know, uh, can cabinerize and you can get a lot of these lesions in a, in a sort of a, some a kid's arm or leg or on their trunk and uh, they can have a, a ton of these lesions. Uh, in patients with HIV infection, because they're immunocompromised, these lesions get really, really large, giant molluscum, and they can simulate uh, basal cell carcinoma and, and other neoplasms. So you have to be aware of that as well. So that's molluscum, another pox virus infection. And please, I'll be very disappointed if, if anybody misses that. All right, so we have uh, one more intraepidermal um, viral infection. And again, this is the same theme of the ballooning degeneration. And notice here, um, there's not the dense, boggy uh, inflammatory reaction we saw in the ORF Milker's nodule lesion. We've got a pretty sparse superficial perivascular infiltrate consisting mostly of lymphocytes. Uh, there might be a couple of histocytes in here, maybe even an eosinophil or two, uh, but not very many. But notice once again, we have ballooning degeneration. Okay, so remember, anytime you think of ballooning, you see ballooning degeneration, think of infection, and then look to see if you've got any pink uh, structures in there. These little teensy pinkish structures are not just there for your uh, you know, visual pleasure. They're actually the little viral inclusions here. So look for those. If you see those inside the cell, you know that you're dealing with uh, an infectious disease and you're dealing with most likely a viral infection. Now, ballooning degeneration is probably, uh, it's far less commonly seen than spongiosis. Spongiosis is by far the most common intraepidermal vesicular uh, dermatitis pattern that we see histologically. Way, way more common than ballooning degeneration. So ballooning, it's got a relatively few number of things that can cause it. So viral infections like here, and this happens to be hand, foot, and mouth disease here, as opposed to, uh, to the pox virus infection. Um, irritant dermatitis can give you ballooning degeneration sometimes. Uh, one of the other ones that's, that's really common is uh, the nutritional deficiency disorders. Uh, those can be associated with a psoriasiform hyperplasia. They often give you an overlying uh, perikeratosis. Uh, with that, which you do not see here. Um, and then, you know, there's really not a ton of others, you know, some of the, uh, uh, the photodermatitides, things like uh, hydro estivali, hydro vexiniformi, those can give you ballooning degeneration. So there's really a relatively few number of diseases that give you ballooning. So learn those. It's nice when the differential diagnosis is small uh, and you don't have to think of, you know, 40 things that can cause uh, the pattern. So uh, again, ballooning, think viral, think you know, irritant, think of photodermatitis and, and then, you know, nutritional, and then there's really not too many other things. So if you, if you have that differential, then, then say, well, what's, you know, which of those four or five is it going to be? You know, is it probably not nutritional because there's no epidermal hyperplasia and there's no perikeratosis? You do, then you start looking carefully and say, hey, you know, there are these little inclusions there. So this, and also the location, this is actually near volar skin. So in this case, it happens to be hand, foot, and mouth disease, which is Coxsackie virus uh, causing this, uh, this intraepidermal infection in this case here. The Coxsackie virus, uh, as you know, uh, can give you a very classic pattern of little lancet-shaped vesicles that are on the uh, hands, the feet, and the mouth. And then there's the atypical Coxsackie virus, atypical hand, foot, and mouth that gives you more of a widespread process. It's often seen in adults. That's a different viral strain that's more aggressive that we've seen in the last few years as well. So just realize there are two, two main forms of, of this. Okay, uh, now this is a shave biopsy and it does not show the classic findings of a viral infection. So we're just kind of showing this as, as uh, something that uh, a virus can lead to. And notice that you've got a vascular lesion here, a uh, proliferation of these uh, uh, blood vessels with these endothelial cells and these slit-like spaces here with all these erythrocytes, both within the lesion and extravasated. Uh, outside the lesion. This is an example of Kaposi sarcoma. Now, why do we show this in the viral um, 
uh, chapter, if you will, well, uh, that's because it's induced by uh, human herpes virus type 8. We know that it's uh, KSHV uh, causes this. So uh, even though uh, this is not a classic viral exanthem, it's not a, an intrapodermal viral process, um, it is a viral induced lesion. And we didn't know that this was virally induced until, you know, 20, 30 years ago. But now we actually know that this is, is caused by a virus. So uh, this would be something that the board might expect you to, to pick up to diagnose from the standpoint of a neoplasm. It's a, you know, it's a vascular neoplasm, a malignant vascular neoplasm that's really not malignant in the traditional sense because it's caused by an infection. So you get an infectious disease that causes these lesions to pop up in many parts of the body, not that you get one lesion that metastasizes throughout the body. So that whole concept changed when we discovered that this was induced by a virus a number of years ago. Okay, so now we're gonna shift gears and look at a couple of uh, non-viral infections. Now there's uh, a number of these as well, and, and probably the one that I'm gonna guess you're gonna be tested on most commonly would be this one. So notice we have a diffuse infiltrate with low magnification. A lot of these cells are pale. Um, there's also these darker lymphocytes admixed within it. And uh, it's kind of involving the papillary and the reticular dermis. There's a little bit of extension down to the base. This, this entity will often give you kind of almost a, a diffuse infiltrate of uh, at low magnification. You can see that there's little, little clear areas. And uh, you can tell these probably aren't all going to be lymphocytes because they're not as jet black as that. They're going to be histiocytes in here, maybe even some plasma cells. You go to higher magnification, you now see when you get these clear areas at low magnification, I want you to be thinking things like, okay, what gives you clear spaces at low magnification? Maybe it's lipid, um, maybe it's histiocytes that are filled with something, like maybe they're filled with uh, uh, globi of Lepromatous Hansen's disease, or maybe they're filled with the promastigotes of uh, leishmaniasis. And in this case, that's actually what it was. So uh, notice here, there's a little clear areas here and these little organisms that are kind of forming this little peripheral marquee or we like to call it the Ferris wheel sign here because we have the Texas star Ferris wheel in Dallas and uh, the state fair of Texas. And that's like the little uh, cars of the Ferris wheel are at the periphery of this thing. And so uh, anyway, this is, uh, this is cutaneous leishmaniasis. And uh, <clears throat> there's two forms of leishmaniasis. There's the old world and the new world. The old world type tends to give less marquee sign. It tends to be more diffuse organisms kind of scattered throughout the histiocyte. Now, that's just a general rule of thumb. I mean, that's not uh, definitive. So again, but if you see that uh, histologically, you might say, well, you know, maybe it's old world leishmaniasis and you find out maybe it's a military guy that was in Iraq or Afghanistan and is back in the United States and he picked his disease up over there. Um, or um, if it's the, uh, well, you get a lot of the classic marquee morphology, well, then it's more likely uh, someone that uh, is maybe from South or, you know, America or from Mexico, or maybe they live in the United States now. We know that leash mania is endemic, at least in our part of the world, in South Texas and even in North Texas. We see probably a half a dozen or so cases a year of people that uh, don't travel outside of North Texas, but they're maybe gardeners or farmers and they're outside and they're often older individuals and they maybe get bitten by a, we know that the sand fly that causes leech mania, the Lutzomaya fly is actually now endemic in North Texas and it's probably migrated up here maybe because of climate change, we don't know why, but uh, we do get cases that, that the patients never leave the area. So if you're looking at this, can you tell the difference between this and histoplasmosis? The answer is yes. Histoplasmosis never gives you a marquee sign. So if you see a marquee sign, it's not histo. And also, if you look carefully, it's hard to see uh, on the scan view because it's about as high as it goes, but you usually a little central dark structure that you don't see with histo. Histo doesn't give you that little dark structure that is actually the area that contains the cilia when the organs actually become flagellated and then start swimming around in your body. Um, here you see the little sort of structure that's this little dark uh, kinetic core, and that's the actual feature of this organism that kind of helps you to diagnose it from an organism like histo. Now, I also encourage you to know all of the other intrahistiocytic parasitic disorders, um, penicillium, for example, uh, uh, donovaniasis can give you this, uh, Klebsiella can give it to you, rhinoscleroma. So the board likes to ask that also. So make sure you know all of those intrahistiocytic parasitic conditions. You need to know every one of those. 
and uh, make sure you know how you can distinguish them histologically. And leash mania is one of those. So uh, this would, this was probably, I don't remember the exact case here, but I think this was a, 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 a North American, uh, you know, Western acquired as this didn't come from, uh, from somewhere over in uh, Afghanistan or whatever. Okay, the board also likes to show buggies that uh, you can diagnose. So you're gonna get a, a question on this. So even at low magnification, you can see that within this structure here, just beneath the cornified layer, there's this nice little organism living in there in this burrow. And uh, this obviously is scabies. Okay, and make sure you know how to recognize scabies. This is the female gravid mite. And here's an egg of the scabies mite here. And notice you see this chitinous exoskeleton here with this little sort of spur on the outside of it. Uh, notice the size of it, it's small. So they might show you this and might give you a differential diagnosis of this and leash mania and tongiasis and another bunch of things like that. This is a hair follicle, okay? And you know that the hair follicle size is, is you know, look down at your arm and you look at the size of your hair follicle, it's very tiny. So this thing is a little teensy tiny area there. If you, you get a, a high magnification, like a derm light or something, you can barely make out these tiny dot of a mite of scabies at the edge of a burrow, at the tip of the burrow. So this is very, very small. And tongias is something, there's a picture of that coming up in a minute, is much bigger, okay? And it's tunneled way down in this area. It's not just this little tiny area that you see in the cornified layer, just beneath the stratum corneum in this burrow here. So that's much, much smaller than the organism of tongiasis or of, uh, of uh, say, uh, something like uh, myiasis, which is a deep, giant larva sitting in the dermis. So size is critical when you're diagnosing these entities. And then also notice the, the morphology of it. Now, the other item that's in the differential diagnosis of scabies for the non scabetic mites, they're about the same size, but they don't burrow into the skin. Those guys are seen on the very surface of the stratum corneum if you see them on a biopsy. And usually the diagnosis there is usually made by like a scraping or something like that. So it's rare to see the mites of say Calliatelia or uh, Allodermanissus sanguineus, uh, bird mites and, and those other kind of mites that, uh, that can give you what really looks more like papular urticaria histologically. And uh, it's usually rare to see the mites. So they look a, a little different. They kind of look almost like little footballs with a snout. Uh, obviously scabies looks different. And, and this is the histologic cross section of the mite of scabies. I, I encourage you to also look at the images of uh, what scabies looks like on scraping because they're very likely to show you that as well. Uh, the inflammatory inflammatory of scabies, it usually has a lot of eosinophils in it. Um, this one's got EOs here and some lymphocytes. And then of course you can get nodular scabies where you don't have any mites left, but you get a, uh, almost a pseudolymphoma a super from deep wedge-shaped infiltrate that's got a lot of inflammation and a lot of eosinophils in there when you're dealing with a kind of nodular scabies where there's no longer any, any mites left. Okay, this, I'm gonna show you this area over here uh, is another infestation. And notice here, we're dealing with something that has burrowed deep into the dermis here. And it's got a snout that is sticking out of this little hole here. And this is an example of tongiasis, okay? And tongiasis is also known as a sand flea. And uh, notice that the outer skeleton of this thing does not have any black spine sticking out of it, like you would see in myiasis. And notice that this thing is all, it's also in volar skin. Okay, so these people usually, they, they go to the beach, they're walking around in their uh, bare feet and uh, these little uh, sand fleas like to live in that sand. And then when you step on the beach, maybe you're playing beach volleyball or something like that, these things will burrow into your foot. And uh, the next thing you know, you've got a little thing that looks like a wart with a snout sticking out of it. And then this little sand flea, a jigo, is burrowed down into your dermis. So notice this is not like scabies. It's not just in this area up here, and it's way, way bigger than scabies. So this is a totally different morphology um, than you see with scabies. And this is part of the organism here as well. It's, it's actually got a little, um, you know, it's set up shop here. It's, it's, this thing is, is locked in to your stratum corneum over here. So, you, can, you know, these little spines, they stick up there. They, they cement themselves in, and this organism kind of then starts growing. It produces uh, eggs and grows, and then eventually it transepidermally eliminates out of you 
uh, when it uh, when it's grown and moves on to the next host. So uh, basically, this thing gets in as a little teensy tiny organism. It grows to maturity and then it leaves and then it you know attacks the next person. So this is tungiasis caused by a sand flea. Okay, the next one is one that we actually now, we, we don't even have any skin here. We just got an organism that was removed from the skin. And uh, you can see it's got this uh, exogenous, this cytoskeleton, this, this exoskeleton. It's got this little spiny morphology to it. It's got all of this insect flight muscle inside here. Um, it's got uh, this area over here, which uh, is also, I'm not sure exactly what that structure is. It may be kind of a digestive organ. Um, here's one of these black spines that we see on the periphery of this. And this is myiasis. That might be the eye, actually, interestingly enough. I'm not 100% sure about that. But um, this is, uh, is cutaneous myiasis, bot fly. Uh, infection. Okay. And, and this is uh, where somebody, again, maybe they go on a, you know, trip down to Costa Rica. These spines are very, very characteristic. And when you look at these lesions, I encourage you to look at the gross morphology of one of these in a textbook. They, they get these little rid ridges of these little black spines on the outside. And this is really classic for dermatobia hominis, which is the human uh, bot fly, human myiasis. And that lesion, because it's called hominis, likes people. Um, there are some that like cattle, some that like, uh, uh, you know, elans and these other animals that live in the African savanna. Uh, but then there are some that really like people. So this organism, the fly actually uh, attacks human beings. So this, this organism we really want to have in the United States. We'd like to keep it out of here and leave it over in Africa where it's sort of is endemic. Uh, but this actually attacks people. It's aggressive. You know, if you ever have been in a situation where there are a lot of these black flies around, um, they aren't your friend. I mean, they really uh, zoom in and attack you. They're not like house flies that sort of accidentally land on your skin. These things go after you and they bite. And so what these things do is that they uh, carry their eggs uh, on their abdomen. Um, they bite you and then you then they lay their eggs on your skin and then you scratch the bite and you inoculate these things into your skin. That's really how that, that happens. And then they burrow down in, into your dermis and, uh, you know, patients often will say that they can feel a sensation of movement when these things are in their skin. And so um, you kind of have to get these things out of there. There have been a lot of different ways of doing that. You can put, you know, like raw bacon on the surface and the, the fly will kind of come out of there. Some people would put them on, put uh, uh, Vaseline and it kind of creates a, uh, an oxic environment and they kind of gradually kind of come out. So a lot of different ways of getting the, the larva to move out of your skin. But this is a you know, lack of a better word, it's a maggot <laughs> that's burrowed into your skin. And it's uh, actually done that because you've inoculated in your skin when it bites you and then scratch it. So they, they very well might have a question about this on the board examination. So I just encourage you to, to take a look at that and kind of see what the, the organisms look like grossly as well as histologically. Okay, this last case, uh, it's really a cool case. And I don't know if I'm gonna be able to show you the actual organism here. It's really subtle. We tried to get some recuts of it to see if we could keep it. Uh, but this was a, uh, an example of a cutaneous, ah, here it is right here. I think it's really rare to see this. This is really, really cool. And notice that that's a little tiny sort of spine. And this is a little, probably part of an organism. This is definitely an organism with a little bit of inflammation. That's also kind of just right in the stratum corneum upper part of the epidermis, almost like it's kind of burrowed in. This is almost, it's not really burrowing like um, scabies is burrowing. This is a uh, uh, situation. This is a swimmer's itch, which is uh, fresh water schistosomiasis that's involving the skin. And there's a life cycle to this thing. This is actually uh, carried by ducks and, and geese that migrate through areas. And so they, 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 they come into this, into a water area. They're carrying these, these organisms. They get into the, the water and then uh, you go swimming in the lake where there have been geese and geese and duck that have come in there and carry these things in there. And then you come out of there and you have this itchy uh, sensation on your skin. And then you do a biopsy. And, and usually what you see is this, uh, you'll see a superficial deep infiltrate with a lot of eosinophils and and inflammatory infiltrate. This one's got uh, again, tons of EOs in these. And so anytime you see eosinophils in a wedge shaped pattern, you think of an arthropod assault. And we like to call it arthropod because here is an arthropod. I mean, this, this isn't a 
an, an insect necessarily. Here it's a, a little uh, protozoan organism. So it's, it's in it, and it is probably an arthropod in a way because it's got a little spiny, uh, you know, a chitinous exoskeleton, if you will. And you can see this thing is just actually kind of burrowed right into the upper part of your uh, skin here. So it's, it's not like a burrow exactly of scabies. It doesn't move around like scabies does. It doesn't have, it's just basically a little teensy tiny area where it's sort of set up shop uh, in the outer part of your epidermis and it's growing and probably these things, you know, release, get back into the water. And uh, if you're, you know, if you it probably eventually you take a shower or something, this stuff kind of goes out of your skin eventually, but theoretically, and this is burrowing into, uh, man is probably really an accidental host here. It's burrowing into another animal and probably a fish or something like that is what it's trying to get into or a cephalopod or something like that, like a frog. And then it uh, is trying to form its, you know, little life cycle there. And we just kind of happen to get in the way. So anyway, it gives you a very itchy dermatitis. Um, it's usually seen in areas where your, your skin is not covered, uh, as opposed to like, uh, you know, the sea bathers eruption, which are little teensy tiny jellyfish that get into your skin there. It's a different type of thing. And uh, that actually uh, will lead to a similar type of cutaneous dermatitis. But there, that's often seen in the covered area of your skin because the jellyfish kind of burrow into your skin. You look down here, this thing may actually have kind of gotten a little deeper just in the epidermis. So it may actually have sort of penetrated down almost like a little spine that sort of sticks in your skin all the way there. So that's uh, an example of a uh, swimmer's itch caused by a freshwater uh, cercaria or schistosome. And it's in the same family as schistosomiasis that causes liver disease in India and things like that. It's, it's related to that. So those are some cool uh, things. It's not every infectious disease that you need to know. Again, as I've mentioned before, uh, make sure you, uh, you look at the chapter, you cover this. I mean, these are, are kind of gimmies. If you know what to look for, you know what the, the, uh, the organism looks like, you know the kind of inflammatory reaction that it exhibits, uh, you'll be able to, uh, to make a definitive diagnosis.